I want to go Bardowski, bruh. Top cheddar, top cheese. Upper 90. Hello everybody, welcome to episode 1 of Breakdown, the series where I break down different aspects of the game of lacrosse. In episode 1, we're going to be going through college lacrosse shooting analytics. But before we get into that, let's first break down my new quarantine haircut. Bruh. Somehow even worse than the first one. Don't know how that happened, but this is going to be a two-part episode because there's a bunch of stuff to break down here. Here's how this is going to go. First, I'm going to explain how I gathered all the data. Secondly, I'm going to take you through my theory for shooting. And lastly, I'm going to give you the results of the college lacrosse shooting analysis and tell you whether or not that proves my theory. This episode has taken months to put together. I've watched hours and hours and hours of film. I manually tracked every shot I could from as many games in the 2020 college lacrosse season. Speaking of, I hope that college lacrosse players and lacrosse players in general are getting the support they need from family, friends, teammates, coaches. I can't imagine my season getting cut short, let alone my senior season. So I really feel for you all. Back to the breakdown. So all the games I watched resulted in more than a thousand shots tracked on my handy dandy tracking sheet. This is what one of the tracking sheets looks like. There are a lot of them. Each sheet contains all the shots taken by one of the two teams in a college lacrosse game. So there are at least two sheets for each game. There are six factors that I track for each shot. Goalie handedness, shot placement, shot distance, shot order, shot result, and lastly, whether or not the shot was a turnover. These factors are all annotated around each shot that's marked on the chart. We'll use an example from the Princeton vs. Rutgers game. Goalie handedness. This one is simple. During the first possession for each team, I look to see if the goalie is a righty or a lefty, and then I use this corresponding chart to track the shots for the rest of the game. It's really that simple. The first thing I do when a shot is taken is write down on the chart the shot result, and I place that in the approximate shot location. In this case, the shot was a miss to the off stick low position of the goal, so I would annotate that here. As you can see on the chart, I've split the goal and surrounding area into six locations. Off stick low, stick side low, off stick hip, stick side hip, off stick high, and lastly, everyone's favorite spot to shoot, stick side high. I want to go Bardowski, bruh. Top cheddar, top cheese, upper 90. The next thing I think about is shot order. This was the first shot taken by Princeton, so I annotate that number in the lower right corner of the shot result. I will keep increasing this number by one for every shot that comes after it. It's pretty self-explanatory. Next, I annotate the shot distance in the upper right corner. This shot was taken from about seven yards, so I write a seven here. Lastly, I annotate if the shot was a turnover or not. For this example, it wasn't, so I'll leave the upper left corner blank, but if the shot was a turnover, I would just write TO in that upper left spot. So that is just one shot, and I do the same process for every shot taken by each team in the game. As I said before, I did this for over a thousand shots. Yeah, it's a painful process. I don't wanna talk about it. Anyway, the reason for doing all this is that I can take these data points, compile them into a huge Excel spreadsheet, which can then be analyzed to tell a story about college lacrosse shooting. And let me tell you, the results were very interesting. But before we get into the results, I need to explain a few more things so that way all the numbers can fully make sense. Let me start by explaining my theory about shooting. For that, let's head to Sidewalls Field. Fair warning, I'm about to brag about myself for, I don't know, the next minute. One of my best accomplishments during my college lacrosse career was holding the NCAA goal streak record from my sophomore until my senior year. That record would eventually be taken by Miles Thompson, but he's pretty good, so what are you gonna do? Anyway, I say all this because in college, my role on our team was to be a high percentage goal scorer. So because of that, I'm really passionate about shooting and I've got a lot of opinions about what makes a great shooter. Basically, if you think shooting stick side high is cool, then you should just go play baseball or something. I really don't know what to tell you, honestly. Just kidding, but this is actually the perfect video for you because it might help you break that bad habit and become a better shooter and player for your team. But enough of my stick side high tangent for now, let's talk about my theory for shooting. Basically, my theory is that if you wanna be the best shooter you can be, help your team win and score the most goals, then you should always shoot the ball off stick low, or at least that should be your default. Shoot the ball off stick low as much as possible, as if you've never heard that before. The theory could also be simplified down to that you should always default to shooting the ball low rather than high. I know, pretty revolutionary, right? Now, let's talk about my reasoning behind this. The first reason for shooting low is that you're forcing the goalie to make a save. When talking about shooting accuracy, I consider there to be two categories for misses. The horizontal miss and the vertical miss. 
All the shooting locations on the net have the same opportunity for the horizontal miss. So I designated an area that I call on frame. This is the area that extends forever in between the two vertical pipes. Just like how the NFL field goal posts technically extend up into eternity forever. It's the same concept. So when you shoot the ball low and on frame, you completely eradicate the vertical miss. If you shoot the ball too low, it turns into a bounce shot. If you're aiming the ball low and you miss high, it's still on cage. So as long as your shot is horizontally accurate when you shoot low, you're always forcing the goalie to make a save. But when you shoot the ball high, you can see that even on frame shots still have the vertical miss come into play. On a high shot, if your vertical aim is off even just a little bit, that ball might never have a chance to score. Unlike the low shot on frame, that even if your vertical aim is off a little bit there, that ball will always have the chance to score. This fact about low shooting puts a lot of pressure on the goalie. The second reason to support my low shooting theory is gravity. Terrible movie, but great reason to shoot the ball low. When you shoot the ball low and on frame, we establish that the goalie is forced to make a save. Goalies are taught to save the ball with their stick head, so when you shoot, they start to move that stick into the path of where they think the ball is going. Most goalies with a regular stance can't get their stick head all the way to the ground without dropping their body some. This is where gravity comes into play. When they try to make a save low, they can only accelerate their body downward as fast as gravity will allow them to drop because they have nothing to push off of. This means that they're dependent on acceleration due to gravity for a large part of that low save. Unlike a high save where they have the ground to push off of, that allows them to accelerate their body upward much faster than the gravity allows them to accelerate their body downward for a low save. I won't get into all the nerdy math and calculations behind this now, maybe for another video. Just know that even though this seems super technical, it's actually a very real and noticeable fact. And finally, the third reason behind my theory. The goalie's twig little legs take up much less surface area and move much slower with less mobility than his hands and the head of his stick. This is the same reason it's harder to catch or block a bad pass that's thrown low and at your feet than one that's thrown up by your head. It's easier for your brain, eyes, and hands to interact with objects that are coming more closely to it than ones that are farther away. There's less room for error in the equation when the ball is coming at a goalie up here as opposed to one that's coming in low at his feet. It's also much more difficult physically for the goalie to move and accurately interact with a ball coming in low than it is one that's near his hands. Just think about it, every day our hands are used for extremely precise and reactionary things, unlike our clumsy feet. So I would much rather challenge a goalie's feet to make a save than his hands and his stick. I know that was a lot of information, but hopefully it all made sense. This is the first time I've ever tried to put my theory into words, and so let me know how you think I did in the comments below. Now let's crunch all the numbers in the shooting analysis and see if it supports my theory. Click here, there, wherever this video is for part two of the breakdown and to see the results. The vertical... Damn, these damn mosquitoes, man.